And welcome in, everyone, to another edition of the Countdown to Kickoff yeah, Show. Woo! Back again. A little bit of a different feeling tonight, along with Rob Ellis and Henry Racich. I'm Joe Krause. Glad to be here. We uh, flush the Monday the night loss, yep. uh, as Brandon Graham said, uh, uh, mm -hmm. after the uh, loss to the Commanders on Monday. We flush that loss, and we look ahead to... Uh, another strange scenario in yep. Indianapolis. We'll talk about all of that. Uh, the Eagles made some moves. They uh, added some support for, how old is Fletcher Cox? 31 or 2. 32, so yeah, 31 right or 32. There. So yep. they added like a 35 or 37 or a 38-year-old couple of so guy to, to support. Combined. Uh, they, they got to get a, Fletcher to spell Fletcher, right? Yeah. yeah, they got an AARP two-for-one deal. Yeah. Well, that just tells you they're going for it. I mean, it, it, as if we didn't already know that, but they don't care. I mean, they're, they're trying to win it this year and do whatever you got to do. Well, is the move by Howie Roseman to shore up the deficiencies that were exposed in that commander game? Hell yes. I, I mean, it, it's a combination of, you know, losing Jordan Davis, losing uh, Tully Polutu. You, you had some injuries. See, I almost got through that name clean. It was eh. But you lose those guys. You bring in two players. You know, Joseph, I don't know, Lindell Joseph. We'll see how that goes. He might be cooked. I think Sue's still got something in the tank. And I, I was saying to Henry a little bit earlier, the biggest thing for me is Sue doesn't miss time. That guy hasn't missed a game in 11 years, and he was suspended when he did. For an interior defensive lineman, that's crazy. He got six sacks last year. I mean, he's, a, he's still a disruptive force. They need it bad, Joe, because, look, the blueprint's out now run all over the Eagles, keep the offense off the field, and they're facing some really nasty running backs coming up here, starting with Jonathan we, Taylor. And I think we may have mentioned this on last week's edition of the Countdown to Kickoff show where I think John Madden gets credit for the quote, football doesn't start until there's frost on the pumpkin. <laughs> uh, this is Great a quote. totally wow. different dynamic uh, around this football team. It's almost hard to understand that – a week ago, right here on the Countdown to Kickoff show, as well as on Sports Take, as well as on Birds 365, as well as Dan Cilio mm -hmm. on the National Football Show, as well as the NFL Playbook, as well as Good Morning NFC East with Jeff Kerr, all of us talking about, hey, who's going to beat this football team? Now it's, a hey, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, right. Who saw that coming? Wait a minute, Henry. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Are we going to get past Indianapolis? As Rob said, the blueprint's out. Well, uh, this is what I was talking about earlier in the season when they're 4-0, 5-0. We're going undefeated. They looked unstoppable. They looked like a machine, a juggernaut that just rolled people over. And I was just saying, I want to see real adversity. Here it is. This is the adversity. Now, when you're 8-0, literally everybody, if they play you, if you're on the schedule now or a possible playoff opponent, they're all looking and dissecting. So we saw a little snippet of it last week with the Texans who had success on the ground. It's a copycat league, and I feel like the rest of the league is going to catch up to this exact scheme. Like The blueprint has been laid. Keep the offense off the field. Run the ball down their throat. And, and, and roll the dice. I mean, who who picked that? What analyst picked the commanders to knock off the Eagles? That's the great thing about the NFL, yeah. right? But, I mean, I think the other thing is, I mean, if we're being honest, they survived a couple of games, Joe. That Houston game, they didn't play well. They didn't play well in that Houston game, and they survived because of the better team ultimately. The Cardinals game, if that if their kicker, if the Cardinals kicker makes that, you're probably in overtime, right? If the so, quarterback slides another six another inches. Another six inches. Yeah, it, I mean. It, exactly. There's a lot of things that could have changed. Now, but that's the game. It's a game of inches, it is. But you, when you win, these things aren't quite as exposed. We're not diving as deeply into it. When you lose, then it's a big deal. But th there's no doubt there's a trend here. It's three straight weeks over a buck 40 allowed on the ground. And it was the other problem – with that game against Washington, they couldn't get off the field on third down. They were 12 of their first 15 converting. I mean, from a Washington standpoint, it's unbelievable. From an Eagles standpoint, it's a disgrace. And that's why, you know, the offense didn't have many opportunities. And they shouldn't be left off the hook either. But this was a major defensive problem. Well, my, my, one of my biggest problems with the game the other night is, okay, I saw the Texans move the ball on the ground. I figured, all right, can, can the commanders duplicate that? Well, well they did. What drove me a little nuts watching the game as a coach is the Eagles were so successful in their tight spread packages with, with the outs that were wide open. Uh, with, when they're in that, that RPO set, 
they're, they're, they're six, seven yards yeah. every single play. Yep. And then they get out of it, and they go wide, which benefits a defense because there's no RPO, and you can lock down a little and bring your D-backs up a little more. Uh, it was just frustrating for me as an offensive guy to, to watch See, them get I away thought, from what was working. Yes. I thought yes. the offensive game plan on Monday night was going to be run the football. I'm yeah. not talking about the commanders. I'm talking about the Eagles' offense. They didn't run the football very much. One carry for Miles Sanders in the first half. They got so outcoached in that game, and we haven't said that all year. I thought Sirianni and Steichen's game plan stunk. Jonathan Gannon made no adjustments during the game. It was they out. They lost in every phase of that. They, they deserve that loss. Well, they, they keep wear. talking about Rivera, but Del Greco had a great uh, Donatel. Put, it, put, it, put it, had a great. A great plan together. Oh, Del Rio. I'm sorry, Del Rio. Del Rio, Del Rio. Yeah. Del, yeah. Del Rio had a great plan together um, for that defense. They I mean. did. But your, your point is right on. You, they get away from the RPOs. They don't run the ball. It, it was a lot of just trying to get the ball down the field. I, didn't, I don't understand that. You don't utilize Jalen Hurts' weapons that he brings to the table. It was almost like, were you trying to get too cute and just surprise them? Just do what you do best. I mean, even in the, at the, in the fourth quarter, that, that one series when they really started pounding the ball and running it, they looked great. I'm saying, where was that all game? It, it's, it's almost like Nick Sirianni gets bored with his, the play calling of just running. Like, what did the commanders do? Run, yeah. run, run. They weren't worried about stats, big no. plays. They averaged 3.1 run, yards run. per carry. I mean, it was, the Eagles weren't getting gashed. It was just, this is what we're going to do, stop it. This is what we're going to do, stop it, and keep you off the field. And, and they rode their game plan to perfection. Yeah, that was the game plan going in. Let's have 10, 12, 14 play drives. Yep. Eat that clock away. Yep. When, when the Eagles do get the ball, it's with short time, long field, and then coming from behind, which no one really saw that. I mean, yeah. we've never seen this team. This is the adversity I was talking about. How do they respond to that? And they blinked. They blinked. Yeah, they, 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 got got the, they got the Peyton Manning treatment. Teams used to just say, let's keep them off the field. Let's just run the ball. Let's milk clock. That's what the Eagles – and now this is where your defense has got to show that they can, they can stop on a third down, get the ball back to the offense and let them do their thing. I think it's one thing to say it. It's yeah. one thing to say, okay, let's come into the game and let's keep Jalen Hurts and A.J. Brown and Devontae and, and Dallas Goddard. Let's keep them on the bench. But you also have to be able to do it. Yep. And that's what surprised me the most, that Washington was able to do it not just once. All they night. were able to do it with some long mm -hmm. drives, time-consuming drives of moving the football, and the Eagles' defense couldn't get off the field. I mean, how many hours of film do you think the commanders watched of game one? Yeah. The Tale of Two Cities. That was a completely it was. different ball club that they played against. Now, yep. I think the Heineke, he, he has a little more mobility, a little... You never know what you're going to get with him. So you might get a Brett Favre from him, you might get, you yeah. know, a Heineke. But, <laughs> but, they, but they, their whole game plan was adjusted and I think it, I, I think it was from the Texans. I, the, I, you go back to that yep. loss, that blueprint was laid by the Texans, who don't have an, an aerial arsenal anyway. Yeah. So, they started the blueprint, the commanders mastered it, and got the win. Now, everyone's going to – it's a copycat league. It is. Now they've been exposed. This is the real adversity. Now what are they going to do? Yeah, and, and this week is Jonathan Taylor, who went off against the Raiders last week. And you're, they're, Matt Ryan is now in game manager mode. So you're not going to try to put a ton on his plate. Plus, he doesn't have great weapons. You're going to get the same thing. There's no mystery here. They're going to try and run it down your throat. Can you stop it? That's really what this amounts to. They're, they're, I don't think the Colts are going to try and get cute. No. I think they're just going to pound Taylor. Why would you? There's no need. So you're gonna. This is this is where we're gonna find out about Jonathan Gannon too. Now he is. A, they're a little banged up, and we don't know exactly what the status. They're gonna be some of the new additions, right? Or how much they're gonna play if they're gonna play. But if you're a good defensive coordinator, you make up for some of the losses that you had, and you make adjustments. He made no adjustments in that game. Now, just for clarity, and 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 you guys are the experts. You can you can give me some clarity. I love Jordan Davis, by the way. Yeah. Before his injury, he played 15, 20 plays. Yeah, it, I would say 20-ish, yeah. Is Jordan Davis, the loss of Jordan Davis, have that much impact 
on this defense that without him, they're shredded? All right, I'll, I'll start. No, it shouldn't, okay? And I like Jordan Davis, too, and he was playing better than people gave him credit for. But, my God, you didn't lose, you know, Jerome Brown or Warren Sapp, okay? You, right. you, you lost a guy who's still learning how to play the game, and I know how big he is and athletic and all that, but it's over the top how much is laid on Jordan Davis not being there. It speaks to the lack of depth at the position is what it does. Well, it's one of those things um, – you, you don't know what you have till you don't have it. So Jordan Davis quietly was becoming – was an impactful player, yep. i.e. he draws double teams, so leaves other guys open for pass rush, for tackles, for losses, yep. all that stuff. All of a sudden you pull him out, and you're like, wow, I can't believe that guy meant that much. That's what happened, you know, this weekend. And you go out and you get Sue in yeah, here yeah. to try to plug the holes in the dam right now. and uh, But you don't that, – that's the impact he quietly – had an impact that we didn't – was never measured. Yeah, but across the entire play of the defense on Monday night, I know we got to get – I know we got to get past that. I said we flushed it. Now here we are talking about That's it. That's funny that Brandon Graham said let's flush it, and he had one of the biggest mistakes. Of yeah, the right. Game. I would be saying well, that too. Yeah, he, he, way, let's just put it behind us. By the yeah. way – that's a penalty. That's a penalty. It, it's we a pen, but we this cannot is so like soft. it. We can hate how soft the league is, but it is a penalty. It, it is. I so. had no the, the Dallas Goddard. We could we could deb- scream about it all we want. That was ridiculous. Right. Brandon Graham's is in this day and age a penalty. Yeah. It and, just and, is. and the Goddard penalty. What, what Kelsey said today. Um, there's nothing to complain about. They didn't throw the flag, so it wasn't a penalty. He said it wasn't a penalty because the flag. Yeah. I well, love that attitude. I will say this: the Eagles, to their credit, every one of them were like. We're not blaming the refs. We lost this game. Put it on us. Every one it of them, from be. Sirianni to every single player. And, they didn't, and nobody, I feel like, nobody whined. I feel like that the Eagles are smelling themselves a little bit. They're 8-0. and They're 8 no. They're cruising. They're knocking teams off. I feel like, you know, this was the wake-up. The pressure of undefeated, that's all going out the door. Yeah, now, gone. maybe this refocuses the team going into week 10, 10, right, yeah. uh, and, and gets them where they need to be. I would say one more, one more thing on the um, on Davis going down, what, what the byproduct of that is, Joe. Big time increased snaps for Fletcher Cox and some of the other guys. And I think it's it's wearing them down a little bit and you're not getting productivity. That's why getting these two guys in here at whatever capacity they're at now is important. Because not only can they get in there and help you, but they can also take some of the, uh, of the snaps away. Well, you away. can expect Fletcher Cox to line point. up, even if it was three years ago yeah. the line up a lot for 70 snaps or whatever the yeah. no, what, whatever the number yeah. was yeah it was a lot it's too mad and he, he look he said himself i feel like bleep is what he said uh, coming off of that game on wednesday he said that wednesday so i mean that that tells you he's he's beat so you you got to figure something out here and that it's it's good look how he's always uber aggressive and i always appreciate that he never sits on his hands and these moves this is what you, you, the only thing you can do after the, the uh, trade deadline's over is go out and make these kind of additions, the guys who were on the street. It's the Countdown to Kickoff show as we broadcast to you uh, from Screwballs. We love coming out to Screwballs and being here yeah. uh, every crowd, week. Great crowd, great Even though, even though last week there was so much hype in the there building was. and there now was. the air is out of the balloon. That's okay. But Indianapolis reality. <laughs> on Sunday. And then the resurgent Green Bay Packers Come in yep. a week after the yep. Indianapolis Colts. We'll deal with the game on Sunday. We'll deal with the latest additions to the Eagles defense. NFL insider John McMullen will join us after the break. I regard, you know, defamation cases as maybe the, the most important or the most uh, profound cases there are because we only get one reputation and you don't get a second chance once it's destroyed. To have your reputation destroyed is really to ruin everything about you. It ruins you, it ruins your family's view of you, it, it ruins your neighbor's view of you. You go to a party, you don't know who's looking at you sideways because they heard, you know, you're a this or you're a that. It is an extraordinarily difficult thing to live with. And for that reason, when we represent defamation clients, uh, it really is the most profound type case we could be handling. All right, let's go 200 Jet X Over the last 17 years, 
We've built a reputation of growing award-winning teams across the country. Staffing is not easy, but that's what we do every day, all day. The key to our success is storytelling, asking the right questions to find the right people. Hi, I'm Gary Kane, president of Kane Partners. We want to be your staffing partner. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you're having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. And back here on the Countdown to Kickoff show as we come to you from Screwballs along with Rob Ellis and the coach, Henry Rasich. I'm Joe Krause. Great to be here trying to uh, get the mojo the back. We, we had so much mojo uh, from Henry Rasich from the coach uh, a week ago. We're trying to gather it all back up. Joe, we're not used to this. They haven't lost a game since January. Yeah, that's, yeah right. It's been right. a long time. Well, I, I say to, uh, as a coach, you don't want this to happen, but... An actual loss makes you better because you learn more when you lose. When you're just cruising, yeah. you don't understand the holes that are in the game that everybody's hunting and trying to find and dissect about your team. But when you lose, all of a sudden you're like, oh, my God, let me look at the tape. That's a reality this is where check. we're weak. We need this. And then it ends up making you a better team on a loss. Forget the undefeated season. I mean, that's a unicorn. Everybody chases it every year, and the hype comes with it every year. But a team like this, it's 8-0. They take a loss to a 4-5 and five divisional opponent. Then they're like, oh, my God, let's check. We need to check ourselves, get off the high horse, and, and tighten up the toolbox. And let's get our NFL insider, John McMullen, uh, into the conversation. Also, you'll find John Monday through Friday on the Jacob Sports YouTube channel with Jody Mack uh, on Birds 365. And he joins us now. Jody Mack, thanks for giving us a couple of minutes tonight, brother. Appreciate it. Hey, how are you guys? Uh, doing great, John. Well, uh, oh. Let me uh, let me jump on this one for you. Uh, I, I'm curious where you stand on the uh, on the Sioux edition and how much you think he will help this team, John. Because this guy had six sacks last year. We know he's durable. The guy does not miss time. He was still out there for anybody to grab him up. But what do you think about that edition? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we're talking about uh, 35 and 30. 40-year-old defensive tackles, if you go back to Linval Joseph, they haven't been playing this season now. They could have been. I, I mean, these are guys who've made a, a, a ton of money in their careers and probably looking for the right spot. They're not going to get the money they want on the big term, uh, long-term contracts because of their age. Uh, from the Eagles' perspective, I, I, I mean, my first reaction is, what is this, Howie from the Northeast? Because they're just signing big-name players. The Jets, First Joe time, Banner, long time, Brown. John. First time, <laughs> long time. Yeah, yeah right. I, I, I mean, it, it seemed like an overreaction to an outlier of the team. Now, I was told a, a, a little while ago that they had been talking to Sue for a while. Uh, so it, it dated back to before Monday night, obviously. So they were interested in that for a while. Limbaugh uh, was there today, got a chance to speak to him. Uh, he said, you know, the Eagles contacted him a couple days ago. So maybe that was sort of a reaction to what happened on Monday night. Uh, what, it, what it can tell you is how he's going all oh, in. I mean, that's obvious. You know, I, I think, I, you know, maybe Dana Stubblefield signs tomorrow. I, I don't know. It could be Gronk. It could be OBJ. Right. I mean, they are going all in. As far as the reality of how much it helps, that's too be I think Linval Joseph helps more 
uh, than than and Dominic and Sue. One one thing I look at the Eagles have four guys that's suited to play the three technique: Fletcher Cox, Davon Hargrave, Milton Williams, now and Dominic and Sue. Um, and they don't they only have one nose tackle right now, and that's Linval Joseph with Jordan Davis on injured reserve. So I don't know. There's a lot of redundancy there. Now. You know, because I, I got killed on Twitter, you know, when you say you don't love something immediately. Uh, obviously, other guys are going to play other positions. Javon Hargrave does it all the time. But the point is, he's not comfortable playing nose tackle. Fletcher Cox is not comfortable playing four eye. Of course, he plays it. Same thing with Indomit and Sue. Same thing with Melton Williams, who play five techniques, seven techniques. But they're not comfortable doing it. They're all natural three technique players and that to me is a lot of redundancy johnny Mc, uh, johnny mack joining us here on the countdown uh to kick off so john is this all because jordan davis is out is that literally what happened on monday night because no jordan davis this undefeated team is now exposed and filled with holes no, I, in fact, that's, that was my concern, that it was just drastic overreaction. And it turns out, as I said, they, they've been working toward the deal with this endemic too, at least for longer. So that, to me, was positive. Um, I, 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 I talked to, uh, with Rob about this on Birds 365. They gave up 3.1 yards per rush against Washington. The longest run they gave up was 11 yards. Yet we have this narrative that's taken off like wildfire. I I don't. It, it, it was it was a loss. I called the Eagles the most well-rounded team in the NFL during their eight-note start. The ironic part was that it was such a well-rounded loss. Everything contributed. The offense is getting a pass here. They turned it over. They were had way too many three and outs. All this contributed. Now the defense didn't play well. But the bigger issue than the run support was the third down defense. And that, to me, was the back seven and the lack of communication. Darius Slade, to his credit, you know, admitted that was his worst game of the year. He's a great player. He's going to rebound. Uh, he's not going to play like that consistently. But all of a sudden, this, this narrative took off. And if you guys think of it this way. If you go through an NFL season allowing 3.1 yards per rush, an 11-yard gain is the longest rush in any game, you're going to be the best run defense in the NFL. And we're all sitting here saying they can't stop the run after that game. It's bizarre to me. Well, I mean, I think it's a, uh, a flashback to the Texans where they weren't really successful stopping the run all night there and then when you watch the commanders go down the field several drives of 10 13 14 play drives and your defensive line appears to be wearing down that's the reflex of these two signings for the rest of the year these two guys they bring in is like one player if you spell them they get under 20 snaps each or you you, you find a way to keep them fresh that's a natural reaction i think as a defensive coordinator uh we're a little light in the front but, again, he's right. The offense is getting off the hook here with their three and outs. When they needed to respond, they were three and out a couple times. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, the a, assumption, it's the, the assumption you're going to be on the field for 83 snaps a game is absurd. I, I mean, yeah, it was an outlier. They were all on the field for 83 snaps. And, again, a lot of things contributed to that. The defense certainly contributed. They can get – there's no – it's not an indictable offense to get off the field. They could have stopped it on third down. But the offense is a big part of it as well. So by no means am I saying the defense played well. But as we sit here, as we sit here talking today, this is an 8-1 and team, the best record in the NFL. They have the number three ranked defense in the NFL. And I feel like this city thinks the sky is falling. Number three. All it's Philly. Do is yeah, well, that's Philadelphia. Actually, <laughs> look at yeah. John, So that means he's what right. That yes. means is what that means is there's two defenses better, so you can get better. There's 29 defenses worse. 
Yeah, and, and where's the contact? Well, and they still have the best record in football because the only other team with one loss they beat head to head and beat them soundly. <laughs> Just to, God forbid, we put early any, in the a, year a, before a, the blueprint. Any more context in there? But right. John, let me let's go to the offense for a minute. What surprised you slash disappointed you the most? I mean, Miles Sanders gets one carry in the first half. There's only one catch for A.J. Brown, and we understand he's not, you know, 100% healthy. He injured himself on that play. But what surprised you most about the ineffectiveness of the offense? Uh, I, I think it was, you know, sort of a, a little bit of a regression to the mean when it came to the turnovers. Look, sometimes there's bad luck. We know the Dallas got it play. They missed a, a face net. Yep. But I give Jason Kelsey a ton of credit for saying, you know, that's a loser's mentality to blame it on an official's call. Sometimes you get the break, sometimes you don't. Um, Quez Watkins, that's just a, a lack of awareness. He makes it to play, he gets up, he fumbles the football. Um, the last turnover was obviously just desperation at the end of the game. Uh, but m- my issue was with the offensive coaching staff, and they've done a tremendous job for most of the year. But I, I think in Jim Schwartz, he's always tell me that games have personality. Game, each game has a different personality. And as a coach, you have to realize what that is. And, and when you see your defense struggling to get off the field, well, then don't run tempo. And the Eagles are, are not only going three and out in that second quarter, they're going three and out with Chip Kelly tempo. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Go three and, and out fast. Even if you... Even if you hand the ball off and, 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 and get two yards and go back and huddle and hand the ball off again and get three yards and your third and five, go back and huddle and then go a three and out, even that's better than doing it with tempo after you just got you saw your defense on the field for 15 whatever plays. You know, you do some comments to understand what's going on in the game. So... I, when I said well-rounded loss, offense, defense, special teams, coaching. It was a well-rounded yeah. loss. Yep. Yeah, I, I, what was the vibe this week, John? I mean, they haven't had that experience in a long time since January. Uh, they, they, You know, all year. And I know A.J. Brown came out right after the game saying, all right, we got that sort of monkey, I'm paraphrasing, monkey off our back, et cetera. But what was the, what was the feeling this week practice and in the locker room in your sense with the way things went down and how they go – forward here against the uh the colts yeah i mean this, 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 it, this team was good during the eight no start and they and they're good compartmentalizing each week into its own and i think it's the same thing with the law mm. i mean if anything there were a couple guys who were happy that they didn't have have to hear 17 and other questions um which you know they really didn't i mean it, it sounds like lip service but when they were winning they didn't want to hear about it, and and now that they're they have lost, they're at least happy they don't have to hear about it because they're only worried about the next game. But then it's a little bit different today because you had and even yesterday with Lindball uh, and Dominic and Sue. So you have this splashy nature of of what Howie Roseman is doing, and the timing is just you know, questionable because from the outside looking in, it looks like a little panic. And, and, you know, you're asking yourself, why is an eight and one team who beat the other eight and one team like a drum? Why are they panicking after one loss? What's the big deal? I I can't answer that question. I don't know why they're panicking. That's why I said it's Howie from the Northeast. Um, But in least, at least from the Sioux perspective, that deal was in the works for a while. Um, so um, they're not happy with Milt Williams. They weren't happy with Marlon Tui Pelosi before he got hurt. And they thought they needed something extra. My concern with Linval Joseph is maybe Jordan Davis isn't going to be back as early as they had expected. And maybe not, maybe expected is the wrong word because when you're on IR, you have to miss four games, and the assumption is, well, he's going to be back for that fifth game. No, that just means that's the earliest point you can be back, and maybe this is an indication that he's not going to be back for that Tennessee game. John, I have uh, two questions for you about Sue. 
Uh, the first one being, do you worry about bringing a guy into the locker room with such a tight-knit group that kind of has a, a villainous uh, air, air about him? And two, what's your over and under on personal fouls from Sue? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, you know, and Dominican Sue is, he, he does have that reputation that uh, I think he stomped on, I think it was Aaron Rodgers. You know, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, he, he's never, you know, he's never missed a game due to injury. He's missed two games in his NFL career, both for suspension. He has never missed a game, and he's at like 190. It's not, he's like 191 or something. Uh, so he's been incredibly durable. Darius Slay talked about him. He said he was a great guy. They were teammates in Detroit uh, back in the day. Um, says he's completely misunderstood, uh, misrepresented. He, he really hasn't had a ton of issues. Uh, what, he does have a little bit of a hothead, um, but it, it's been a while. It's been a long time since that happened. So I, I don't think that's a concern. And, and Joseph is a tremendous teammate. Uh, he and Kelsey already love each other, have so much respect from playing against each other so much. Um, I, I don't think that's a problem. I don't think that's ever a problem with this locker room because they have such strong leaders. Uh, with Kelsey and Brandon Graham and Fletcher Cox and players like that. So I don't worry about those guys fitting in. I just don't. Yeah, we're talking about 34 and 35-year-old guys, and, and, and they were great players. And they're not great players anymore. But the expectation of being great is always there. In other words, you think about pro ball players. Sue's an all-decade player, you know, five-time all-pro. So you sort of have this basis of, oh, and Tom and Sue's coming in here. And Tom and well, he's coming in here to play 20 reps. He's never done that before. Can he be effective with that? I don't know. Hasn't played all year. Linval Joseph, same thing. Two-time Pro Bowl player. One of the best nose tackles of his generation. He's not that player anymore. Can he be effective with 20 reps? No idea. 34 years old. Hasn't played this year. That's why he is NFL insider John McMullen joining us here on the Countdown to Kickoff show. Great stuff, Johnny Mac. Well done, brother. Good Appreciate job. you, man. All right, thanks, Jack. All Take right, care. good stuff from Take John care. McMullen. We'll get to a commercial break. The Countdown to Kickoff show rolls on from Screwballs. Back in a moment. Celebrating the life of your loved one is what we do at Life Celebrations by Givnish. When the matriarch of the Dalloway family died suddenly at 82 years old, Life Celebrations by Givnish stepped in. They will make this the easiest thing that you, it, it, I know it's not easy, but it, they will make this as easy as possible. Life Celebrations by Givnish, customizing services as unique as the individual. I, I just know that my dad, who is in charge of everything, was, it, was not in charge of anything at that point when, when my mom passed. And uh, um, again, just another uh, shout out to this place for, for making it easy. Turning tragedy into a celebration of life, no matter how hard, is what we do at Life Celebrations by Givnish. Life Celebrations by Givnish, customizing services as unique as the individual. Don't wait until after Thanksgiving for leftovers. It's the new leftover sales event at Jeff D'Ambrosio Destination Downingtown. Jeff must get rid of hundreds of new 2022 vehicles on the lot. Rams, Grand Cherokees, Wranglers, Jeff has them all for less. 
Jeff has reduced prices and payments to the lowest they've been all year. And Jeff knocks down high interest rates, save thousands more than anywhere else. Plus, get more for any trade or lease return. You always win at Jeff's great selection, best price. Hurry in now. Jeff D'Ambrosio Destination Downing Town. Nobody treats you better. Black Friday sales event. Score and save in Southeastern PA in Delaware with Colony Pools this football season. And let the experts close your pool with a custom Merlin safety cover in green for the birds. And if you join our winter watch team, we'll give you another 20% off and Colony Pools will handle it all. Keep your tiles on your pool, not in your pool. Fly with Colony right now, birds fans. Visit flywithcolony.com. And back here on the Countdown to Kickoff show as we come to you from Screwballs. Love Screwballs. Love being here every single week. Oh, come on, Ted. You can do come better on, than crew. that. Ted's the man. Come on. This is where the heart of the fan base lives in yes. Montgomery County. Yes. No doubt about that. I agree right? with that. I agree with that 100%. All right. Good stuff along with Rob Ellis and the coach, Henry Racid. Special thanks to NFL insider John McMullen. Got him back. A lot to unpack there. Some interesting thoughts. He wasn't uh, real impressed with the moves. <laughs> yeah. He didn't like... He, I think he... I don't view it as a panic move, Joe. I view it as an aggressive move from general manager who sees an issue. I would t- I'll take that all day. And if you don't get anything out of them, you're not paying these guys all that much. So what? It's not, it's, you're not losing anything anyway. But They're insurance policies. Yeah, and your point's great. Like You're, you're not asking them to be what they were 10 years ago, 12 years ago. You're just asking them to, to get you... Essentially, either to Jordan Davis or help you against the run, and if it could do that, that's great. Want to get your accomplished. Want to get your thoughts on one thing that Johnny Mack had mentioned, and I don't think we talked about it. I'm sure you've talked about it on Sports Take, Rob. But and you actually you even uh, referenced it with John. The offense is not getting a lot of blame for the loss on Monday night, so we flushed the loss away, but. You still have to come into the game against Indianapolis trying to understand where the offense is and, yeah. and, and, and what it means. It certainly wasn't the offense that we talked about for the first eight games. Yeah, I, I think, you know, people are sort of looking for something to lean into Gannon for, and Steichen gets a bit of a free pass slash Nick. They're getting a little bit of a free pass here. I, I thought the, the game plan stunk, frankly. I thought the, the, until late they didn't lean on the run game enough I don't know how Miles Sanders gets one handoff. I just, for the life of me, in the first half. That guy's a home he, run hitter. Yeah, and he's been excellent he can take all year. Any ball, yeah. 80 yards. And it's not like he hasn't been good all year. He's been, he's been excellent all year. So I don't get that number he one. He doesn't get the ball enough. That he, drives me nuts if he doesn't touch the ball enough. Me too. And you mentioned going away from, from the RPOs as, as much as they did. I don't, I don't understand that either. I mean, it, it is so difficult to defend this team when they're running that. And, and Jalen can kill you a million different ways with the give, with the keep, with the pass. You got away from that a little bit. It was just it was just a curious game plan. And and John makes a great point of them staying in hurry up when your defense is gassed. What are you doing? You got to recognize what's happening on the other side of the ball. And there was a, there was just a real th- they really did not coach that game well. No, I mean that, that RPO offense is an offense of choices. So the quarterback makes a read. If it's there, um, he gives. If it's not there, he keeps or he he passes. Every one of your choices is an A level player. All of your three options, not like you have any deficiencies. They don't have one deficiency in that offensive. Let me ask you this, and you guys both can answer. Dallas Goddard, A.J. Brown, Miles Sanders. Now, we know Goddard's out. Yeah. Smith. De- Devontae, throw him in there, too. Yeah. Who is the most significant impact player out of that talent? i say A.J. Brown. I would say A.J. Brown because he can catch it five yards out, break a tackle, and take it, take it 50. I, I, I say Hurts. Oh, you you throwing Jalen in there? Did you throw Jalen in there? I didn't you, throw Jalen oh, in there. No. Okay, then I retract I that. I'll go with Brown. I'm trying to right. understand Jalen's weapons because now, and I think it's Dallas, and now Dallas is out. Yeah. Goddard is out. Well, well Dallas, is, Dallas is the apparent heir to the question being answered by that because he's the last one – that's the most dangerous. He's a guy that drags. He does all the dirty work. 
And, and that's a guy that when a quarterback gets comfortable, he does his check downs. Maybe Goddard's the prime on a lot of them because he's never drawing double coverage. A.J. Brown, Smith, yes. the outside guys are, yeah. are the attention. Yep. That's why Goddard's having the season he has. If those two guys aren't out on the, on the perimeters, he doesn't have half the catches mm-hmm. or half the yardage, period. So the, his performance is based on the defense's perception of what they're looking at. Yeah. So I feel like A.J. Brown, of those three weapons, with hands as a receiver, I don't know who can stop him on a slant. He's such a big body. If you put the ball in the right place, he's catching over any cornerback in this league. So I, I would go with, with A.J. Brown, and Goddard is just a, a beneficiary of the weapons around him. Well, the, the other thing that you're going to really miss with Goddard is he's a great blocker. He's right. a great all-around tight end. This is not a guy who just goes down. Like, no, no, no offense to Zach Ertz. The guy's an Eagles Hall of Famer, but he wasn't giving you. Sorry to see Zach, by the way. Yeah, he's he, done for the season. Yeah. That is a shame. Well, you should touch him, too, and he'd fall down. He had no yak. Yeah, he wasn't a yeah. yak guy, and right. he wasn't a blocking wasn't necessarily his thing. Right. Dallas Goddard's a really complete tight end. So that, that's a huge loss. Don't get me wrong. The other thing is, A.J. Brown had to have been hurt. He hurt himself on the first catch, and he wasn't right the rest of the game. He changed his cleats. Did you notice yeah, that? Yeah, he did. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and Mike Quick pointed that out on the, on the telecast, too, or the broadcast. I, he, he had to be hurting, Joe. And I, he's still a little banged up this week, too. But for him to have one catch, something's wrong there. So I, I think there was, there was just a lot of stuff that happened in that game, man. You don't usually turn the ball over. They turn the ball over. You had injuries. You had guys not performing at the level in which they were accustomed to. Offensively, I'm talking about. All those things conspired for you to lose. First eight games, Dallas Goddard was the guy on offense that bailed Jalen out. Mm-hmm. Agree or no? Yeah, yeah I, he's a bailout for sure. I, yes. Yeah, I, they're gonna, and they don't have great depth there. I mean, you're, you're, you're going to lean on now a, primarily a blocking tight end in Stoll and a rookie in Calcaterra who is much more of a pass catcher. Those two might complement each other. But it's going to be pretty obvious if they're not both on the field. If Calcaterra is on the field, you're throwing. If Stoll's on the field, you're running. Are There's they making? There. What I'm trying to figure out is yeah. what what adjustment will the Eagles' offense make? Will it be the same without Dallas Goddard? I feel like what the Eagles did not do is what is lean on their security blanket, and their security blanket is their run game. Yep. And Sanders must get the ball more. It's just it's ridiculous that he has one carry in the first half. You're not up, you're not up 30 points and just throwing a ball around or or just trying to grind it down. He's a weapon. He's a great screen guy. Like he needs the ball more, especially with Goddard going down. You have to get those backers to come up and respect the run yeah. and get these other tight ends behind them. It's just it's chess, and, and and they didn't play good chess the other night. I'd be shocked if if it isn't 15 to 17 carries for for Miles Sanders this week. I'd be surprised. I, I think a way they might compensate a little bit for Goddard's injury is Zach Pascal might play a bigger role. You might see him involved a little bit more. He's also a very good blocking wide receiver, so you can have him on the field and run situations, and he doesn't hurt you. He's unlike most wideouts who are allergic to blocking. He can actually block. So I think he might get involved a little bit more. He's an ex-Colt, so I think there could be a little bit more incentive for him to do something against his former team. I'll be interested to know, I don't, and Nick will probably never admit this, how much he picked Frank Reich's brain this week. You know, I'm sure two, he picked it a lot. Yeah, and they talk all the time, you know, but especially this week. Eagles the offense way. normally lines up two tight ends, three tight ends. How much of that is going to change against the Colts? Um, they're not a bad defense, actually. The Colts' biggest issues are on offense. They're passing offense, they're running offense. Now, mind you, Taylor missed two or three games. That hurt their running attack because when he's there, they run it well. But their offense is not good. Their defense is pretty good. You know, they're, they're, they're without Leonard now for the season. And that's a big loss, but that and that side of the ball for them is going to be a bit of a challenge for the Eagles. I really feel like the Eagles' offense bounces back in a big way, even though their their defense is good. Yeah, the mistake that was made this weekend on offense was uh, I watched in the game uh, whenever Hertz was doing his read fake, they weren't following the read; they were keying him yeah. to pull. Yep. A right, couple times he pulled, and he boom. There's two guys sitting right there. They're keying him now. Mm-hmm. That's why that run game is more Why effective. are they doing that? Because he's so dangerous when he does pull it again in the last eight weeks. Does he's he, gotten seven, eight, nine. Yeah. You, you know, but does he, pull, does else he but pull more than he doesn't pull? No, he does. He reads, but I think they're, I, I think they're like mush rushing the run a little bit where they're not committing to anybody. And at that time, any, any read he makes, if it's not a give to the back, he's just programmed to keep. 
but he keeps, and then they jump to him. Yep. Like, they, they stay on the back a little bit, waiting for him to pull. They're keying Hurts for the run. They shut his running game down this weekend, and they, they didn't give enough. If I'm the Eagles, their run game is so good. Their first three touchdowns should be on the ground. Or at least impose your will on every team with your run game. I think they have one of the best offensive lines in the league. Yeah. And when they get a run rhythm, your run rhythm sets up the pass game, even for your linemen. So when you start coming off the ball and you're dominating the defensive front and you're moving them back, that buys more time for your pass game, right? So I just think he gets away from the strength of this team, and that's the run game. Pound it down people's throats. The, the commanders pounded the ball down the Eagles' throat. Yeah. The strength of their offense is their run game. Obviously, they don't have a top 10 quarter, top 20 quarterback. They don't have a beasted receiver. That's they're a one trick pony. Yeah. And look, in fairness to Steichen, you know, this is the first time I, I really felt like this after a game with them offensively. Like I, I there were maybe stretches where you said, oh, they could have run more here. They could have taken it. But I thought for the most part, they went in with a really good game plan with wh- whomever they were playing. Not this week. Is Steichen calling every play on offense? I can't say he's calling every play. I don't know for sure. But it looks like it. When you watch Sirianni, he's, he's sort of delegating. He'll walk over and talk to the defense. He'll do this. Do, like he, I don't think he's sitting there calling every play. I'm not saying he could override anything. And they've said that. Like he, and he may take a series or two. But I do think the primary play caller is Steichen. Henry, you're the coach. What is Jonathan Gannon looking at? When he, you go to cut away on the sideline. There's Jonathan Gannon. His scheme is on his 8x11, fold it in half. What's he looking at? He's like, look- like, is he looking at the next play? Like, what's he looking at on his, on his chart? This is, this is what I had a sense in watching the game as it progressed a little bit. And there's no way to prove what I'm going to say, and there's no statistic or any way to measure it. I feel in a sense that the Eagles may have been looking past this team a little bit. Like, they handled them. When you destroy a team like that, how can you take them? Out? How do you th- I mean, now? Monday it night, ha- prime it time. Happens. I mean, it happens. You're a division rival, division right? Division game. You're going to look past the okay, so Washington let me ask you this. for do the you Colts? Think, do you think, who do you think put more prep into that game? The commanders watching film over and over of game one or the Eagles? Go off of what I said. When you lose a game, you watch more film. You dissect everything going on. The Eagles have been cruising. I'm not saying they completely were like lax in the game, but at some point in the game, they're like, yeah, wait a minute. Well, we to step your, it up. To and your they point. didn't step it up on offense. Yeah. They went hurry up, three and out. We, listen, the defense is struggling to get off the field. Other units, either the special team or offense, somebody has to elevate their game. Yeah, nobody did. And nobody did. Well, that's to the, your and point. And that's the adversity I've been talking about. That's true adversity. Absolutely. I mean, to your point in and terms of that, again. it was like a mini bye week wow. from the game that they played in Houston. Yes, it was. Until days. you got to the Monday night coming off of a bye week. Well, take it. Yeah, Joe. So Rob, take you it caught a loss. A potential loss later in this little weird, yeah. quirky stretch. Nobody thought no. they were going to trip up against the Commanders. What I am, I was right. concerned with going in. I, a, a, I, I told everybody if you were betting, take Washington with the points. But I thought the Eagles would win a close game. But I, I agree with you. I, 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 what, what also concerns me is they had 11 days off and they played two games in 29 days. That screws you up. You know, these guys are creatures of habit. I'm not making excuses. Ritualistic. Yeah, but I think it factors in. Like, and, and, you know, we were sitting here last week, and, and one of the conversations we had was, it's just such a weird week. You were coming off all the Philly stuff, and they hadn't played, and they were undefeated, yet the city wasn't quite on fire like we thought they were going to be. We had all those conversations. Maybe the team was feeling weird, too. I don't know. Like, I think they're much happier, even in a weird way, to have a short week, to be back in their rhythm, flush it as we talked about a little bit earlier, and just get right back at it rather than sitting there for 10, 11 days stewing on it and thinking about it. I think it actually may help them. How many drives did the Eagles offense come on the field needing a score and go out? Previously, you're saying. or, or no, about In this game. Monday? Was it two or two? Yeah, probably two or maybe about three, that. Maybe three? Yeah. Where they that. had to either go kick a field goal to go ahead or, or get, a touchdown. Yeah, yeah. And they went and they choked. I'm going to say choked because the game they – had, they had plenty – more than one opportunity to, to yeah. offensively go win this game. Yeah, I mean, to, to, when you're the, – the Watkins fumble was gigantic because, A, it was a really big play. I can't remember exactly what the score was at that point, but he fumbles there. That, that was a go-ahead score. That would have put him ahead. And then the Goddard thing, you're driving at that point, too, likely a first down. 
with some momentum. So the turnovers just killed them. I mean, and, and that's something they hadn't done all year. They're the best takeaway you know ratio in the league. So and they were fluky turnovers. They weren't yeah. uh, uh, haphazardly handling the ball. They were like. You know, walking his hit from behind, just trying to get up Face and score, yeah. and you get twisted and you get injured. And the, the ball, it wasn't. Uh, they were quirky. There's some bad luck. Some yeah. bad luck factors in. That's why I look at this week. I, I I don't anticipate them turning the ball over. I think they're going to be able to run the ball. And you know, the the one question I have, I still have until proven otherwise, I'll, I will question it. Can they stop the run? I don't know. I think everything else. I think the offense will be better. I think the game plan is going to be better. Uh, they won't turn the ball over. I can't promise anything with special teams, but I don't know if they can stop the run. I think Slay's going to play way better. He he wasn't good. The secondary had all kinds of miscommunications. I went back and I watched it on Tuesday, and there were some real issues with the safeties and the corners communicating. That we hadn't seen that all year either. So I think a lot of this gets fixed simply because they get smacked in the mouth, and they haven't all year. I mean, they can stop the run, but it's it's hard to ask any defense to do in four and five, thirteen play oh. drives. And then show up at the end of the game, you know, fresh when you really need the stop you need to get. Think about this. The first half is 30 minutes long. They were on the field, the offense, for less than seven. That's crazy. <laughs> you know. It, that's with commercials. That's crazy. It's crazy. absurd. That's crazy. You know, and, and the defense is dragging ass, by, especially by halftime. And then they're, you know, there's a cumulative effect of that, effect of that where they can't get off the field. The offense is three and out. And you're like, here we go again. I grab my helmet. And I'm right back out there. And all those things snowball. You know, there was – I didn't see any, like, reverses or little gadgety play. You know, it, it just – if I'm Sirianni, I, I want to see this team come out and, and give me three drives on the ground where we get a touchdown. Like, dom, they don't understand. When you dominate, this team has the ability to dominate pretty much any team in the NFL on the ground. Mm -hmm. But they don't do it. No. They get away from it. And that's the thing that, that – it's so demoralizing – how demoralized it was for the Eagles' defense to give a 13-play drive and give up a touchdown on the ground. You said 3.2 a carry? 3.1. So, yeah. uh, 3.1. Yep. So, on fourth down, it was under a yard when you add all those up yeah. to get. Yep. And how many fourth down? They got, uh, uh, like, two or two, or two maybe Whatever fourth down was, conversions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, that's not like the Eagles have the ability to do what teams are going to do against them. They have the best ability, one of the top three in the league to do it, but they don't. Like, throw the ball when, you, when you've when mashed teams and took their will to be there, and they're going to start overloading to stop your run. Then yeah. your weapons are wide it, It's got to be a little bit of the mentality of last year where you just decided this is how we're going to win. Because they we're, didn't have a passing Yeah, they didn't have it. They, now it's there, but, but just get back to it on Sunday and run it down the Colts' throat. Countdown to kickoff show. We'll take a break uh, as we come to you from Screwballs. Our Screwballs. final break coming up, and then on the other side, uh, we'll get picks and predictions from Rob Ellis and the coach, back in a moment. Evolution Energy Partners has helped hundreds of businesses save millions of dollars on their energy spent. They offer electricity and gas procurement strategies, efficiency audits and engineering and financing solutions, as well as online utility bill management. To learn how your business can save visit www.evolutionep.com or contact Chuck Herschella at 610-329-8288. Evolution Energy Partners Energy Solutions to improve your bottom line. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Cantor, Novak, Beaver, and Pike is a full-service CPA firm with offices in PA and New Jersey offering first-rate accounting, audit, and tax services. They focus on helping clients achieve their business and financial goals from startup operation to long-term financial planning. For more information, call Terry Cantor or Dan Pike at 215-550-2954 or on the web at cnbpcpas.com. 
At Whistler Pearlstein LLP, we assemble the most effective team to handle all of your legal needs. There are players and pretenders, but our hustle and heart set us apart. In practice now for over 75 years, we're proud to be one of the most prominent full-service law firms in the Philadelphia region. We offer 17 different areas of practice, including business, corporate, and tax education law, real estate, zoning, and land development, municipal law, and litigation. Our top-rated attorneys and staff are laser-focused on client success. We strive to provide outstanding legal counsel with the highest level of care and consideration. Let us show you the Whistler way. Learn more at WhistlerPearlstein.com or email Michael J. O'Donohue at M-O-D at WhistPearl.com. WhistlerPearlstein.com or M-O-D at WhistPearl.com. And back here on the Countdown to Kickoff show from Screwballs. Great to be here uh, again as we lead you into Eagles football uh, on uh, Sunday. Colts, uh, Eagles on the road, back home on the 27th. It's a Sunday night game, and Aaron Rodgers and the Packers uh, come into Lincoln Financial Field. We'll send somebody from Screwballs uh, Ooh, tonight all right. uh, to that Packers game uh, on Sunday night. So thanks for coming out. Your odds are pretty good tonight <laughs> uh, as the city's still in a little bit of a hangover after the uh, loss uh, a week ago on Monday night. Anyway, back to normalcy. Uh, I, I guess normalcy with a Sunday afternoon one o'clock game, Matt Ryan, Jonathan Taylor, the Indianapolis coach, uh, Colts, uh, a new coach coaching his second game. Coaching his second hey, he game. shut a lot of people up. He did shut a lot Good of people up. Good for him. Up. And it was uh, on the road, which is not easy. I, the one thing I'm curious about with that is you did the whole us against the world thing last week, right, right. where everybody doubted them and you stuck it to them and you talked about it afterwards and all that. Can you maintain that emotional pitch for two straight weeks? I wonder if there's just a little bit of a letdown, if that little bit, because they're not a great team, cost them the game this week. I do wonder about the emotional pitch of that. Well, I wonder having a head coach that was a center, an offensive line guy, is, we're going to do the same thing. If the commanders can do it, we can do it. Sure. With this running back back here coming off of that win, I mean, they're going to come in flying high. Yeah, they're they not to use the Eagles thing, but, but – uh, and, you know, with one less day of rest, the Fletcher Coxes of the world and the, this, this defensive line that got worn down a little bit, I don't know, there could be a little battle of attrition early in this game. One day, it doesn't sound like a lot. No, it is. But when you're an NFL guy. That, By the that, way, are you off Are, are you off the bandwagon now? No, I'm not. <laughs> this, this, I'm, more, I'm, I'm more on it now because I want to see how this team reacts. This is the adversity I've been talking about, 1-0, 2-0, 3-0. That's great. You're blowing out teams that are not 500. But what happens when you have adversity? This is a brick wall. This is a defining week. As far as the season's coming, they've been whitewashing teams in the first and second quarter. Yeah. This is how do you respond to you getting bullied in your own living room? They got bullied in their own living room the other day. It's a character kind of game. Right. It this is. is a character. And, and I think they have a lot of character. I, I, mean, I, I mean, scheme wise, you know, I haven't lost faith in the coaching staff. I haven't lost faith in the players. I just want to see this team. If this team rebounds from adversity, why not? By the way, why have you not lost confidence in the coaching staff? Because I knew at, at some point in time, the rest of the league always catches up. They always, you know, every year we get this team that seems to skyrocket out in front of everybody. Whether it's a lighter mm -hmm. preseason schedule or not as physical, or they just click a little better. You know that that happens every year. Everybody catches up. They catch up to Michael Vick. They catch up to Patrick Mahomes. They, the league always catches up, and then it becomes a copycat league. You know, to finish the stretch. Um, I I didn't see them under any true adversity all year long. The other night, I was watching adversity happen. I saw them not respond to true adversity. Now, here it comes again. You think that the Colts didn't watch that game and say, we could do that. And then the team after the next team, we could do that too. So, when listen, 8-0 is great, but you're the hunted by everybody. And everybody's picking you apart. And everyone's talking about how do we beat you. And then somebody figured it out. A sub-500 team shocked the world on Monday night in the Eagles' living room. This week is, to me, of all 17 weeks, this is the most important week. The answer 
to the adversity. I think it's a big Jalen Hurts week. I think they're going to run the ball and they'll get they'll establish Miles Sanders and they do what they should do on the ground. But I think Jalen Hurts is the kind of guy, and he, not that he was terrible last week. I thought he was he was okay. And no, nobody was good. Let's face it. They they lost and they deserve the loss. I think he answers the bell and plays. They follow his lead, man. Here's my concern about that. Yeah. The quarterback clock to get rid of the football, as you know, yeah. is fast. And when the clock strikes, there's no Dallas Goddard anywhere on the field. And that safety valve of Dallas Goddard picking up a big first down, making a making a great catch, getting yaks at, getting but yaks it's not after Dallas the catch. Goddard. It's not him. The player, his his skill, it's not him. It's everyone around him that le- lets him. I don't know. I think it's more him. I don't think we're giving him enough credit. I listen, think it's more Goddard. Listen, Goddard, Goddard's a, a hell of a player. I'm not saying he's not. But what I'm saying is this. Nobody comes into the offense, scouting the Eagles offense, and go, we got to stop Dallas Goddard. That's not the first thing they say. It's probably the third thing that they uh, – Brown – and then when, when Brown yeah, but that's hurts, not what I'm talking about. What I, and, I, and I I don't disagree with you. What one of these I'm backup saying, tight ends might have a Dallas Goddard game. But what I'm saying is that Dallas has been the one yeah. player on offense that has been there for Jalen and allowed him to be bigger than he's ever been and, before. And, and now that he does not have Dallas. What I'm saying is this. You have that opinion that it's Dallas Goddard. I think it's the scheme. I think it's the other weapons around that allows him. I'm going to say Dallas. I'm, no one's coming in this week that's as good as Dallas Goddard. But I'm going to say that that safety, that safety valve that's there, if there's a player, if Dallas is an A, if there's a B player, this offense is so well-rounded that a B player can become an A player. It's, Anybody in this offense could be the A that day. Especially if Jalen Hurts is the guy who we think he is. You know, we, we've talked a lot about him being in the MVP conversations. MVPs and, and phenomenal players, great players, elevate their games and overcome this kind of thing. We're going to find out about Jalen Hurts. It's third and nine yeah. from the 34. Who's Jalen throwing the football to? A.J. Brown. <laughs> Whoever's open. Yeah, it, yeah possibly. Uh, here's what you might see. You might see Miles Sanders get a lot more involved in the pass. Who did Jalen throw the football to the first eight games? I'd, yeah, say, it, it I'd say it was Goddard. It was Goddard in that situation. But I, I think they have – you have so many weapons here, man. I, I, I'm telling you, there, there's enough to go around. You're not – you weren't just a one-trick pony. That's the good thing. You had a lot of options – Sanders out of the backfield is a possibility in your scenario. I think A.J. Brown, where you can break a tackle, is a scenario. They got to get Devontae Smith a little bit more involved, too, period. I mean, I know he had a touchdown last week, but generally, he's pretty quiet. They need to get him going. That's a a big part of this thing. Everything for this offense. This RPO offense, uh, one of the options in the RPO is to run, and the other night, they didn't run. They didn't use that option in the RPO enough. The, the run keeps everybody honest. Everybody honest. You know, if Sanders gets the ball seven times in the first half, you have a different offense. Mm-hmm. Because Sanders, at any given moment, can go 80 yards, and he will draw more attention off of the fake. I, we ran that offense with my, my youth program. It is a very hard offense for, because all the linebackers have to freeze and wait. Usually any other offense, we're going, we're blitzing, we're, bl- we're reading, we're scraping. This offense, you can't go. You have to wait to see what they do. When the defense has to wait to see for the, what the yeah, offense does. Yeah, but you does. just said when, in, earlier in the show that they weren't waiting. The commanders no. were keying on Jalen. They were keying mush rush. They, were, they weren't committing. They were just, you know what a mush rush is when you don't come up field? You just, yeah, you're showing you just sit it. there and you just, yeah. you try to cover, you guess sometimes. Sometimes they guess. But when they were guessing, they were guessing the hurts. Yep. They weren't guessing towards the, the, the first fake, the first read fake. And they didn't give the ball enough to that first guy. When we run the offense, we establish dominance on the run. Then we pull. And then all that other stuff opens up. The Eagles never established dominance on the first read. 
They didn't give it to Sanders enough where he's popping you for five, six, seven. Then all of a sudden, you're key in there. That's when the pull happens. That's when Hertz gets the running lanes or pulls up and hits one of the RPOs. The most important part of the RPO is the first read guy. And that first read guy did not touch the ball enough, period. Yeah. Was why they kept stalling. They need then you go, hurry up, and I, you don't give it to the first read guy. I think these guys are too smart. I'm talking about the coaching staff. Not to recognize the mistakes that they made last week and, and correct them and go back to what, what brought you there. You got there doing what Henry said, and, and, and that's the thing. And you got there utilizing these weapons, and you didn't utilize anybody well. Who, who's who had a good game? Okay, you're Nick Sirianni. I, I, nobody, right? Look, you're Nick Sirianni, and this year's offense, take a picture of it. And go last year's offense, take a picture of it. Last year's offense had Hurts and a running back, and an offensive line. Now he has all these toys. So I think sometimes yeah. they get too creative with the toys. The toys are there. Put them in a toy box. Establish, what got, establish what's going to make those toys open. Mm-hmm. And they just never got into that rhythm the other night. Yeah, against they did. The commanders. They did. They, just, they, they were like, oh, let's, let's go here. Ah, it didn't work. Oh, let's go back over here. No. Do, do that run sets that whole offense up. Without the run being established, the RPO doesn't mean a thing. Well, this becomes a cute little uh, five-yard pass offense. Yep. Coach, the, the job of the coordinator is to adjust based on what's happening Bad in adjustment play. game. Bad adjustment Bad game. Bad adjustment both game, coordinators. Period. Both coordinators. You, uh, right, let's start with Gannon. You, they weren't even pretending like they were doing anything other than trying to pound it down your throat. Yeah, occasionally McLaurin, whatever. But they were pounding it down your throat. So what do you do? Are you going to run blitz a little bit more? Are you going to do some stunts? You can do some things, just anything, to give him a different look. I didn't see it. And then the other side of the ball is Steichen. Everything Henry just laid out in terms of getting away from the RPO, getting away from what your strengths have been all season, and, and falling into this thing just sort of trying to get it down the field. You finally, finally, later in the game, started running the ball, and you had great success. It felt like it was going to look like – do you remember uh, the, the, the Cardinal game? They just basically had that final drive where they took all the air out of the ball, and, and they only got a field goal, but they ended up, it was a game-winning field goal. He stayed on the ground. Stayed on the ground. Houston game, stayed on the ground and just said, see ya. We, we're enough playing around with you guys. It, it felt like it was going to go that route, but it didn't go that route last week. I mean, I mean, in that game, to me, the Eagles flinched. They overreacted to the commanders coming down and scoring, and they felt like they had, they had to answer fast. Yeah. You don't. You don't. Like, put the toys away. Like, they should, they should play in the dirt. And then play in the dirt, muck it up, and then go to the shiny toys. But the toys. They tried to do it too fast. They went to the toys too fast. It's also where the turnovers really bit you, too, which they they hadn't been an issue all year. As ugly as all this was, if they don't turn the ball over, they still win. You know, we're sitting here saying, we're giving you another they survived kind of game. That's what we're giving you again had they won that game. And and they did. And, and, you know, finally it didn't happen. So there was a play in the game where they ran the ball. like twice in a row, and the crowd was like, like obnoxiously cheering. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. They, they, they were, the Bronx cheer. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I mean, if you're Sirianni and Steichen, just do what got you here. Like, do what you do. That's the crux of every game plan. Should be like, do what we do until they stop us. Yeah. And then when they stop us, then I have answer A, you know, B, C, and D. I, but they just go to the toys too fast. They want to get the ball to everybody and look like this flashy offense. You know, you do have flash, but. Use it at the right time. I think one of the strengths of Sirianni is he's not stubborn to a fault like a lot of coaches. No, he'll, he'll, he'll self-evaluate yeah. and self-correct. Yep. And, and I, he doesn't have an ego, no. which I like about him. Yeah, I mean, turning over the play calling, a lot of other things that I've heard and seen from him show me that this guy will make adjustments. I I think there's going to be big time adjustments. I think he got into them good this week. He'll never admit it publicly, but I think he got into the players and his staff. He knows, they all know that this was not a good job. They all came up small. Uh, and, and, and I can tell you this, like a coach, as much as you don't like to lose, like th- this happened to me. I've had teams on big, you know, our team was a juggernaut for a while. You know, it's like good for them. Like they, they needed this. They needed to be yeah, humble. Yeah. Now let's refocus. Let's stop dealing with the press. It's all these celebrations. And, you know, it's just things. They were doing things yep. that the football gods don't like. Amen. You know, even A.J. Brown taunting all the Steeler guys. And I was like, oh, when he did that, I was like, oh, that's going to come back injury or, or bad game or something, but I just think this will refocus the team. Yep. And it's a good time to get a loss. Yeah. If there's ever a You're good right. time to get a loss, it's week, going week 9, 10 into the double no, digits. No more they're peaking too soon conversation. Right. What, what will c- the coach and Rob Ellis say 
next week. <laughs> we'll find out on the Countdown to Kickoff show quickly before we say goodbye. Prediction for, right. uh, for the game. Henry, go, ahead. go ahead. I'm going to go. Uh, I can say they're going to refocus. They're going to do the right thing and pound on the ground a little more. Uh, I'll go 28-17, Birds. I think it's 31-21. I think the Eagles win. I think they get back to who they are. I think their identity comes through in this game. And they uh, have to show people what, that was a fluke. Yes. This is us now. And I think they want to show a little chip on their shoulder. themselves that, too, right. more than anybody else. All right, good stuff tonight here from Screwballs on the Countdown to Kickoff show. Uh, again, special thanks to NFL insider John McMullen for joining us. Don't forget to like, smash the like button, and subscribe. See you next time, everybody.